third crow. And when you see the third crow, then, then it's time for spring to begin. I saw the first crow when snow lay heavy on the ground. Willow not yet golden, alder not yet crimson bright. Second crow watched snow melting, released from prisons of frost, rivulets trickling, icicles shrinking, day by ever longer day. Daffodil noses test the air, snowdrops bow and nod. Buds burst on the branch where third crow sits, his back to winter and his face to the sun. So what, what happened is that um, I'm learning this, I'm learning about my history in reverse. And I guess maybe that's the way we all learn about our own history. <laughs> As we get older, we, we start to reflect back and then we learn, I think we learn a lot about ourselves. <laughs> Um, so, um, one of the things, uh, which I didn't actually really know when I read, when I wrote A Really Good Brown Girl, is that I didn't know that I was actually born on a road allowance and, um, and that my family was living on road allowance. I didn't know that, but now I do. Um, and so I'm going to read... Um, a couple of poems. This one is called Monuments, Cowboys and Indians, Tin Cans and Red Wagons. And it's basically, um, what, just a moment in time of us living in an old schoolhouse, which my father bought and moved to just a vacant lot, just open prairie, basically because the little house that we're, we were living in, the little shack, I should say, we were living on in road allowance, someone tried to burn it down. So then my father bought this old schoolhouse and he moved it out into the middle of this, basically this lot that, uh, that people had that were sympathetic to our family. And we, I don't know how many years we actually lived there. Um, no running water, of course, no toilet except for the outhouse and the water. We used to get our water from the Red Deer River and uh, and we transported it by dog and sleigh. <clears throat> we lived at the end of a road that dissolved into a field, flat as a table and the color of deer. Although I saw no deer there, that field rolled out for miles to a deep cliff that fell to the, the river and that Red Deer River was our source of water hauled home by our black dog, Chinny. Our old schoolhouse jut out of that flatness like a misplaced monument to the wanderings home and away of an extended family of half-breeds. Kids scattering to cowboys and Indians, tin cans and red wagons. Teenagers jiving to Del Shannon, migrating settlement relatives, searching for work, their wives or old ladies in tow. And on Saturday nights with two weeks pay, the silk tassel, pilsner and fiddle tunes would flow weave through auntie's rank laughter, mum's step dancing, and my brother's yodeling. Cree would occupy the house like a new code. The partying would heat up the walls and spill out the windows and doors like light through cracks. And that old schoolhouse had the long divided windows and the same paint the school board issued when my father bought it. The sun's rays, a potato peeler that curled the paint away from the boards, where that field spread out and away from that schoolhouse, like an epic film shot, until the sun sank into the wet field between the house and river, ending our days like forged steel dipped 
in water. One of the things that um, um, the Métis will very likely fight against the rest of our time and existence is defining who we are. And uh, it's really, um, it's painful actually when people erase us um, only by mentioning treaty. And treaty is extremely important, but there were other people around that lived around treaty that didn't get treaty. Um, and many of those were Métis and non-status people. So I've called this the colonial gaze. Every language, even yours, is a partial map of the world. The colonial gaze deserves a pair of thick Indian affairs glasses, generic black frames and heavy lenses correcting tunnel vision, the blindness outside its own centering. It needs to think outside the empire, now quickly exposed as narrow and irrelevant. Erase the whiteboard of words. Cover to pretend it's uninhabited. Verbs in the infinite. To colonize. To enter someone's house and start renting out the rooms. To civilize. To construct the imaginary abject savage. I am star for language that doesn't erode me. Erase me as terra nullis in a couple of swift syllables. The colonial haze folded, blind, too long leaning on tropes of indigenous deficiency. It's zealous modern phantoms, progress. Enter the ghosts that never leave the table, their gluttonous colony. Uh, this, this one is about, um, this next poem is called Nistamina. And it basically means me too in Cree. And there's a number of Cree words um, that you may or may not remember. Nistamina, me too. Um, what are the words? Migawi um, means mother. Notawi means father. Nimiton is my mouth. Mistikwan is my head. Um, beat the gray is to come in, come in. I come sounding after. Nistamina, Nistamina. Sweet syllables recalled, summoned from a dormant motherly shoot, ripening its way to larynx strung to my sound belly. Aural memory loosening a sound root stretched over dusty tongue and ear, pulled together, no sound alone. Union of larynx and lips, sounding our Nehiawi wind body song through our moose stew and bangs. Our dry meat and baked bannock, our bone marrow soup. I come sounding after Nigawi, Notawi, and some swimming of a brother's laugh splashing in my face. I come sounding after Nimushum, Nukum, Nistamina, Nimiton, Mr. Guan. This tongue loosens, delights, lights, enlightens. Aural memory arriving home from a long time ago. Nigawi, thank you for birthing me. Notawi, thank you for never leaving me a sound alone. Nistamina comes from you both, recalling sound sliver. Nistamina, my mother combs my hair. My, my father too. Nistamina, my brother teases me. Nistamina, they call me back through kin vibrations. Faces envelop me in the electric energy of affinity opening the front door, beat the way. I am a ventriloquist of my parents, nokom nimoshom, my lips, tongue, larynx, thread sound of the same mother tongue, stringing nista, 
to me now. I'm tired, nistamina. I'm hungry, nistamina. I'm lonely for your sounds. I think I'll just finish with um, a, a poem which is called Spits. And uh, it's basically this idea of you know, often people will say, oh, there's Métis, and then there's Indigenous. <laughs> it's like, please don't do that. Métis are Indigenous. Um, check section 35 of the Constitution. <laughs> it says First Nations, Métis, Inuit are all Indigenous or Aboriginal, I guess is the actual term. But quite often, you know, I get that, uh, and people don't think it's it's, a big, it's like, what? You're going to say, you are going to divide, you are going to separate me from Indigenous. So that's what this poem is about. Spits. Some spit stinking seed thoughts from a fruit bowl of bruised colonial mislabelings, identity markers, and veiled co-constructions of vanishing Métis. Words slung around a mail sorting room of cut kin stinging. Smell the blood, cut kin, the erased, the rubbed out, sandpaper bones of so-called relations. Some people are free to mouth words while other people suffer, barely survive them. Words sometimes from under them crawl, the dark undersides of detonations. Relational platitudes are swept up and thrown in the dustbin of dreamt up terms for Indigenous. Sorry doesn't reconcile anymore. Sorry doesn't quiver a forgiving bone in my Métis lineage. Sunflower stories, relational contritions. Sorry no longer reconciles. So I'll finish there.